Welcome to the Sunday service at Perth Grace Baptist Church and we are joined together today with the express purpose of considering, um, believing in and adoring our God. And um, well first Joe has asked me to introduce myself. Um, I'm John Sutherland and my wife and I live in the hills near the village of Glenfarg. So at the moment as I look out the window we are surrounded by fields of deep snow um, Anne and I, for many years, have carried out ministry uh, work of various kinds. Anne initially trained as a geography teacher and has never lost her, uh, her heart for teaching. And I originally trained in forestry management before studying for the ministry. Um, but before we go any further, um, before we look at God's Word and... Um, try to understand the the message let's come to God in prayer and seek his wisdom and his enabling by his spirit let's pray together our Lord God as we find ourselves coming to you we understand that you have already come to us through your son Jesus Christ and through your word and through your spirit we pray that as we open your word, as we read it, as we try to understand it and uh, apply it to our own lives, Lord, we ask that your spirit would open up our hearts, even those dark places, so that the light of scripture would shine in and renew our lives. So, Lord, we just pray for your, your blessing, your presence with us, and that in all that we do, in studying your word would be for your honour and for your glory. In Christ's name, Amen. Well, having introduced my wife uh, and myself, I'd like to introduce you to three people mentioned in Scripture. And uh, you'll see um, some modern day illustrations to represent these three people that Anne has kindly drawn. And the first is a very wealthy, well-known young man. You can see him here in the picture, having stepped out of his chauffeur-driven car, about to board his private jet as he takes a last-minute business phone call. The second, he's a son living with his mum in the country estate. Now with him, his picture, you see someone who recognises his need to worship, but having bought his DIY worship kit online it's delivered to his doorstep and he's all ready to do um, his worship and then we have the the third the third man is blind and as a result he's very poor and begs for money to survive we've pictured him sitting on a cold street pavement blind but hoping people will be kind and generous to him uh, his warm coat is the thing that keeps him warm. It's important to him. It's precious to him. So these three, um, they have some things in common and yet they're also quite different. It's likely that all three could hear, speak, feel and taste. All three could walk. Um, two lived outside the city. Two had lovely clothes. Two had servants and lovely big houses. All three are mentioned in scripture for us to learn from. But let's step aside from these three for a moment. Um, the Gospel writer records many of the parables Jesus told uh, to teach either the crowds or his disciples. And we're going to have a look at two of those parables um, that Jesus spoke to his disciples when he was having a break from the crowds that were pushing in against him uh, when he had been teaching him, teaching them. Um, the crowds had been following him. He'd even retreated to a boat um, so that uh, he could have space and be able to speak to them clearly. Um, and this is while he was on his way from Capernaum to, to Nazareth. So the, the two parables are found together and they illustrate the same spiritual truth and we can read um, them halfway through Mark's gospel um, sorry Matthew's gospel in chapter 13 
And so we're going to read um, those three verses at the moment, verses 44, 45 and 46. And you'll see them come up on the screen. So Matthew 13, verse 44. It's uh, the parable of the hidden treasure. So the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. Then the next two verses. And um, we have here Matthew 13, 45 and 46. And... Um, called the parable of the peril of great value and we read there again Jesus speaking here teaching his disciples again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and he bought it so two uh, parables uh, teaching and illustrating the same thing. But let's just have a look at that for a moment. So burying a pot with valuable treasure uh, and possessions um, in a memorised spot in a field it wasn't uncommon in Jesus' day. It was your way of stopping a thief who had broken into your home in the dark of night from taking your irreplaceable items of value. Examples of these are found in archaeological digs dating back to, to this period. So Jesus uses this example. The man recognises the worth of what he finds in the field, but it's not his until he buys the field, until he buys that bit of land. Then he has ownership of it. So what's he going to do? He, perhaps doesn't have the money needed in his waste pouch. Um, he, perhaps he doesn't have enough valuables back at his home. And perhaps he's now even got to consider selling his goats and the sheep that he's been breeding for years, trying to get them to be the best that they can be. But perhaps here he persuades his wife and his family that they should go sell all their valuables, those prized sheep and their goats, and sell all that they have, including their home, for this purpose of buying this field. And why? Because it has something in it. It has a treasure that is buried in it. And this man knows the field and the spot in the field where this treasure is. It is worth selling all in order to gain this field and the treasure that is in it. Well, the other uh, parable uh, is illustrating the same. And years ago, we came across a book called uh, The Precious Pearl um, by Nick Butterworth and illustrated by Mike Inkpen. Mike illustrates beautifully Jesus's parable of the precious pearl. And he illustrates the merchant as this portly man uh, with his wealth around him and he eats triple portions of wonderful food but it's at the end of the parable that the self-made wealthy merchant who even has to sell his hat exposing his balding head to raise enough money he's portrayed as being so overjoyed to have bought this most incredibly large and pure pearl his life search is over and he is satisfied. His eyes are gleaming, his face is shining bright because he has found the thing that he has been looking for, searching for, learning about. So there's three observations we can learn about these two parables, just very briefly. Um, so there was extremely valuable treasure, treasure in the field and the precious pearl. Both men find the treasure. The man in the field knew the worth of what he had found in that pot in the ground. The merchant had been purposefully searching and following the clues, learning how to identify a precious pearl, 
how to authenticate it if he was to come across it, so that when he saw one, he would know with certainty that this was a precious pearl. Both of them sold all that they had to buy this priceless treasure in the field and the pearl. So Jesus uses this parable. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meeting. It's important in letting us see a spiritual truth. Well, what are we being taught? Well, we've been taught that here is a spiritual treasure that money cannot buy. We should be putting everything into the search and our knowledge of what is treasure so that when we do find it, we will know and be able to authenticate its value. And lastly, the prized treasure is very costly. It will cost all that we have to get it in faith. We are not to waste the currency of our hearts on the wrong thing. So Jesus uses these parables to teach. And there comes back really some questions to us. Do I realise the extremely valuable spiritual treasure that Jesus is talking about? Am I diligently searching for that treasure? Am I learning all about it? Will I be able to identify that treasure? And lastly, have I found it? So am I prepared to pay the exceptionally high price for the spiritual treasure? What is the cost? All. Everything. This is what Jesus is teaching his disciples spiritual treasure and its value, the treasure in the field and the precious pearl. Well, I want now to move from these two parables into some real life examples in scripture and see what we can learn from them. So we're going to use the lens of these two parables that Jesus gave us to try and give light and wisdom over these three people, their lives, their circumstances, and um, learn from them. The three people are a very wealthy and well-known young man, um, secondly, a man who came from the hill country of Ephraim, and thirdly, a blind man. So in doing this, we'll be able to identify the truth of their lives and their actions. That's what we're going to see. First, we have the very wealthy and well-known man. Well, let's read. So if you have your Bibles, and we'll put it uh, up on the screen as well. Um, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. I'll just read these few verses. So this is Mark 10, verses 17 to 22 the rich young man, reading from the ASV. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honour your mother and your father. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So that's the first person we're going to look at, the rich young man. Secondly, we're going to read about a man from the hill country of Ephraim. And we read about him in Judges chapter 17 and 18. So Judges 17 and 18. Now, um, I've condensed the passages and missing parts out so that we can see the narrative um, in, in a condensed form. 
but you can go back and read chapter 17 and 18 and you'll get the, the full narrative there of the life of this man. So Judges 17, um, this is about Micah. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. His mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. He gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image and it was in the house of Micah everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This first part of the passage, we, if you read it in detail, you'll see that Micah had stolen from his mother and then gives it back to her and then they make this idol. Verse 7, now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite and so and he sojourned there. He came to the hill country of Ephraim to the house of Micah and Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in. And Micah ordained the Levite and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. Well, moving forward into chapter 18, it starts by saying, In those days there was no king in Israel. And he said to them, This is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me and I have become his priest. At this point in the passage, what's happened is um, the idol has been stolen, taken away, and they've taken away this uh, young Levite priest as well, along with the idol. And we join it again at verse 17, and we hear the account of what happens as Micah realises that his priest is gone, his idol has gone, and the other items of religious importance. Verse 17. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image. When they had gone the distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the house near Micah's house were called out and they overtook the people of Dan. And he said, You take my gods that I, may, that I made and the priest and go away. And what have I left? How then do you ask me, what is the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back home. So there we have the account of um, Micah, Micah making an idol and ordaining a Levite as his own priest, uh, having worship in his home and all that is taken away from him and he's left with nothing. Thirdly, we're going to look at a blind man and we find the account of him uh, also in, um, in one of the Gospels in Mark 10 verses 46 to 52. Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus, Mark 10, verses 46 to 52. And he came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, telling him to be, to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. 
and they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. So we've read there in scripture of three people and we're going to look at those three people very briefly in the light of what we heard Jesus speak, those two parables that we, we heard. The, the first was about the treasure that had been buried in the field and this man comes across and the second is the precious pearl which the merchant had been searching for and finds. Both of them sell all that they had in order to gain this wonderful treasure. So then we've looked at three people, a very wealthy and well-known young man, read about him in Mark 10 and in Luke 18, a man from the hill country of Ephraim called Micah, we read about him in Judges 17 and 18, and then thirdly a blind man called Bartimaeus, we read about him in Mark 10. Let's look at each in turn, see if you can notice similarities and differences between them as we look at them in the light of these two parables. Well firstly we have the very wealthy and well-known young man you'll see an uh, illustration of what um, he might be like in modern times. He knew he was looking for a precious thing. He had something empty inside himself. He'd been searching for some time and finds the treasure and he's even willing to be humiliated in public to find out just how much it costs. Remember, for a man like this with all his wealth, would it cost more than he actually had? He may be humiliated. But he comes to Jesus with a currency of good deeds. Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Jesus' response, what is it? You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. The cost we saw was too high for him. He turned away, despondent. He's disappointed finding that this religious observance that he had kept up from his youth was not sufficient to pay the price for the treasure that he was seeking. Jesus wants more more than he is willing to pay and also in a currency he is refusing to pay in. He was unwilling to repent and turn to the Son of God for salvation. He continues to walk in sin, to walk away from Jesus Christ. Oh, what a huge mistake. This man, this self-made man who has gathered so much wealth as is made now. He was just one hurdle short of the finish line. The need to repent and turn to Jesus for salvation. And he refuses to jump. He refuses to bow the knee. He refuses to look to Jesus as a saviour. So that's the disappointment of the first young man. We see in him that he is unwilling to pay the currency and the price that is necessary. He is unwilling to give all. Sir, secondly, we look at Micah, we read about him in Judges 17 and 18. Well, he thought what he should be looking for was, again, something religious, uh, religious observance, but how was he going to do it? He lived in a time when there was no king in Israel and people did what they saw fit. He knew the importance of seeking and worshipping God in the way that God had set out. 
Um, but he chose to use his wealth to fill the spiritual vacuum that he had. He tried for a long time to find the wrong treasure in the wrong place. And not finding a Levitical priest to come and work for him as his priest, initially he chose one of his own sons and he ordains him as his own priest. He tried to fill the need for a priest with a fake one, one of his own making. But he perceives that his fortunes have turned uh, and this man, this Levite, a true Levite, ordained by God uh, as a group of people to serve in the tabernacle, to facilitate the worship of God, comes to him, comes to him in the hill country of all places and uh, to the house of Micah. And Micah says to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest. I will give you, what will I give him? Well, ten pieces of silver um, each year and a suit of clothes and a living. Well, m this Levite went in, no doubt thinking that this was the best job possible. Doing his calling, fulfilling it in a place where he was valued, where he was given so much silver suit of clothes and a living. No worries, no need to live by faith. And so Micah has something closer to resembling the authentic worship in the tabernacle, but it's not the real thing and it's not acceptable to God. Micah creates fake treasure to try and satisfy, satisfy his heart's desire we read that in Judges 17, verse 4. A fake god is skillfully crafted. It's an idol. And the idol is taken by the priest. We read that in Judges 18. And Micah is challenged by the people of Dan when he chases after them with his neighbours. You take my gods that I made and the priest and go away. And what have I left? How then do you ask me, what is the matter with you? You see, what he thought was precious was now seen to be of no value and almost cost him his life. He treasured it, but when it came to crunch, it was worthless and he almost lost his life. He's empty, he's dejected, he goes back home. He only finds out when it's too late that his heart treasure was the wrong thing. He spent some of what he had on the wrong thing. What did he do? He formed and fashioned um, something that God had, had not ordained. It was of, of his own design. He walked in sin. He chose not to do it God's way. Well, that's Micah. Let's look lastly at uh, blind Bartimaeus. And again, you'll see an illustration. He knew what he was looking for. He had been hearing about the long-awaited Messiah. Was this Jesus, him, the Messiah? Well, the blind man, Bartimaeus, he knew he needed a miracle to get his sight back. And, well, he knew this Messiah... Jesus was a miracle worker. Others, well, the crowd, they tried to stop and block him and quieten him. He still cries out. And we see that he's not disappointed in Jesus. He sees the miracle. He regains the sight. He was right to accept the highest value demanded by Jesus that of putting all his faith and trust in him. This blind man knew his need and that it could only be met in the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. And so he walks in faith and righteousness, saved, rescued, delivered from physical blindness, yes, uh, but more importantly from his sin by the only one who could.
Jesus Christ. You see, Bartimaeus, well, his heart was ready for the moment of encounter with Jesus. Perhaps during his years of blindness, he had chosen not to become bitter, not to become angry at God, but rather to consider, to desire after this Messiah, this hope of um, glory that was going to come from heaven, this rescue. He hoped and believed in him. He had grown to love him, although he had not yet seen him. He had a joy that filled his heart as he thought about him. And when it came to the moment that Jesus was passing by, he called out to him, shouted to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then lastly, we see that he follows him. He receives the miracle and he follows this Jesus that he'd been waiting for, becoming more like him each day, putting off the old self and becoming clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. So, in closing, where does this leave us? Well, let's go back to the parables and learn the good news. Jesus is the prized treasure in the field. He's the peril uh, that is worth buying. And we find him through studying God's word. It's a treasure map and we find the treasure there. It points us to Jesus we should seek Jesus every hour of every day to know him, to desire him, to trust him, to love him and to find our joy in him, to pray to him until we find him with all our hearts. We need to seek him. But we need to learn that it costs everything to have the treasure Jesus in our heart. Everything else has to be given away, to be pushed out in order for Christ to come in and to be seated in our hearts as Lord and Saviour. He demands our hearts and our lives so that we will gain the most precious treasure in all the world. The prized treasure is so costly. It will cost all that we have to get it in faith. We are not to waste the currency of our hearts on the wrong thing. Don't wait. We read in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, Behold, now is the favourable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God the Father asks us, and the Holy Spirit challenges our minds and our hearts. There is a spiritual treasure that money can't buy. Do you know Jesus Christ? He is the altogether precious treasure, the precious pearl. Jesus is the prized treasure and we find him through reading scripture. It's a treasure map. Well, are you searching for him? Matthew 7, verse 7 and verse 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who... Uh, asks receives he who seeks finds and he who knocks the door will be op uh, the door will be opened we should seek jesus every hour of every day to know him to desire him to trust him to have a love for him in our hearts and call on him in prayer will you be able to identify him how are you going to be able to authenticate the real jesus we need to know him through scripture. Here we will find wisdom and the knowledge that we need. We hear God say to us in Revelation twenty two seventeen, The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. We hear these words in Isaiah 55, verse 1 as well. So why is the writer uh, saying these things about the water of life? It's offered without price. Simply put, Jesus has paid the price. A very expensive price. He came from heaven to earth. The Son of God and gave his own life a sacrifice for our sins. His blood is there to purify us, 
to bring us into a right relationship with Christ. Our sins being washed so that what is red becomes as white as snow, as white as the snow in the fields outside as I look out the window. He bore the weight of sin on himself, our substitute, our propitiation. It costs everything to have the treasure of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. He demands our hearts, our lives, so that we will gain the most precious treasure in all the world. And in Luke 9, verse 23, uh, we read, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and daily follow me. Well, in a moment, I'm going to ask a question. And God watches and listens for your heart response uh, to his calling. But in, in concluding, let me first ask, which one of these three people do you think you resemble? What is your heart's desire and what is your end? Where is your heart? Are you like the wealthy man? Uh, are you prepared to pay the price? We could say he was an almost Christian. He was almost willing to, to give up everything. But his money wasn't a problem. But his love of it was. He wasn't willing to give up something good for something that was better and the best. Are you like the rich man? Or secondly, right, like Micah. Are you like Micah? Um, I don't need this treasure. I have my own treasure. Um, I'm religious and I've got these precious things. But are they a fake? Or are they a fraud? Are they worthless, a pretense? And don't leave it to the last minute to find out that your faith is based on the wrong thing. It's focused on the wrong thing. We need to discover if our faith is truly on Jesus Christ. So this man, Micah, his currency was a fake substitute for the true worship of God. And he finds that he goes away empty and what he had was worthless. Are you like that person? Or are you like the blind man, Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus had nothing. Perhaps the only valuable thing he had was the coat that he was wearing. And yet he was able to buy the precious treasure. His cloak, his jacket he left behind immediately. It was probably the most valuable thing he had and yet he leaves it immediately in exchange for the treasure of being born again, becoming a son of God and all through the precious blood of Jesus spilt on the cross as a sacrifice for us. Uh, we need to practice this daily, daily listening to God and being willing to obedient, be obedient, be an obedient servant. So which one are you like? You might even be asking, was it fair of Jesus to expect Bartimaeus to leave all that he had and to follow him? This is where we need to be clear that we need to come to God, not on our terms, but on his terms. Not our way, but his way. He set the price and he has also paid the price. And he invites us to pay everything to be his. The opposite of this is to trample over the cross and to trample it on our way to hell. Placing no worth on the treasure of heaven. Stamping on it. Stamping on Christ and his life. And Jesus says, come. And Bartimaeus, what did he do? He followed Jesus. He immediately sprang to his feet and he followed Jesus. Do you love Jesus Christ? He is passing by, searching for his lost sheep, calling them out by name. And do you know that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and seeks after and finds that wonderful treasure in Jesus Christ than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Luke 15 verse 7. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went, sold all that he had and bought it. Real faith is loving and trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know who God is. The Christian faith is about relationship with God rather than just an intellectual acceptance. And that was what we see with blind Bartimaeus. He bought the pearl. So what is your response? God is watching and listening to your heart's response. And what's it going to be? We read in Mark 10 verse 21, Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have, give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. And if you want more, more help in understanding this and to be delivered from your sin, to follow Christ, to be blessed by God and to buy this treasure. Bow the knee to Jesus Christ, pray to him, call out to him and by all means uh, come and get in touch. Well, let's for a moment just consider and bow our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Our Lord God, we thank you for Jesus' beautiful illustration of the treasure in the field and the wonderful pearl, each treasure being of great value. Each of the people that find the treasure recognise its value and sell all that they have to get it, to have it and to have joy in it. Lord, may that be our experience that we would see the value of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that we would treasure him, desire him, pursue him, and give you our whole hearts that we might know him as Lord and Saviour. Lord, we thank you for your love over us and that you seek us out as lost sheep and we thank you as well that there is rejoicing in heaven when even one lost sheep turns to you. Lord, we just lift each person now uh, who's joining in with the service to look to you and to find salvation in Jesus Christ. So we ask your blessing. We ask forgiveness. And Lord, we pray that you would be able to, um, that you would be willing to um, help us to focus on Christ each and every day. And we ask it in his wonderful and his precious name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.